often offers wise and timely limits to free speech as a way to return to our nation's founder's vision for free speech. Rowan, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this um, day you've given us. I thank you for bringing us here at this point with Rowan and her, all her diligence and her hard work. I thank you for the, um, the joyful attitude that you have given her throughout this whole process. At no point has she um, grumbled or complained. She's joyfully faced every challenge, and now she arrives at the, the fruition of all her work. And I ask that you would bless the time that she has, give her courage and grace as she speaks. Um, you are good, and we love you. Amen. Cancel culture has taken an increasingly prominent role in public discourse. This modern form of ostracism impacts both one's personal and private life. What is canceled as a result of one uttering an opinion that is deemed offensive by the masses? When is the after one is after one is canceled, the masses then retract their support from that person and from that person's platform. Cancel culture creates an environment where the sharing of free ideas is, where the sharing of free ideas is, where the sharing of free ideas is not in, is not endorsed as is not endorsed as something that is good for the public opinion. It is a react cancel culture is a reaction of a group of people against an idea that they disagree with that effectively silences the person that is that has been deemed offensive. Cancel culture makes it so that it doesn't matter whether the person speaks freely or not, they are effectively ignored in the public square. The way cancel culture polarizes opinions makes it so that their idea that it makes it so that people are less willing to share their ideas in the public square. The way the lack of civility with, with which those ideas are received makes it so that people who share people are less eager to share the ideas that they have. This eagerness for sharing ideas was prominent in the founders plan for the new government. Since the colonies had fought for and won the right to speak not only for them uh, to speak for themselves in government in the Revolutionary War, the founders assumed that freedom of speech would be a prominent tool in the governmental structure that they would create. The masses would be able to use this tool along with, along with others to better themselves and to flourish. American freedom of speech is considered a key part of American culture and is often and America is respected for such for having such a quality at, so ingrained in their governmental structure. However, modern Americans have lost sight of the value of free speech as they use as their use of free speech today does not reflect what its original what the original purpose of free speech. Instead, people use free speech as a way to shut down those to shut down and stop the ideas of the the ideas that they disapprove of and think that are offensive this has turned free speech from a helpful tool to a harmful weapon this cancel culture restricts flourishing in that idea there is no sh free share of ideas and free flow of thought used properly free speech enables discussions to take place so that man is able to grow and flourish both morally and intellectually free speech is defined as any and all articulation by man that is not inhibited simply speaking 
all speech is free speech until it is, it, until it is stopped, either directly or indirectly. Limits upon free speech are rules used to moderate people's speech. They are a standard or a guideline put upon communication. I have categorized the different kinds of limits into three categories. The first, widely known and assumed rules, widely known and assumed rules. For example, the rules of etiquette. These rules are enforced by society and culture as a whole. The second category are widely known rules that are only used by a specific group of people, usually professionals. An example of this would be a gag order in the court of law or a non-disclosure agreement in a business deal. These limits are enforced by the, by the professionals who use them, but often have backing by the legislature. The third category of limits are theories which are more or less widely known depending on the current popularity of the concept. Joel Feinberg's offense principle, which states that the prevention of offensive behavior is the state's business is an example of such a theory. These limits are enforced by those individuals who, believe, who choose to believe that they are true. Now that we know what limits and free speech are, we must understand why they are necessary. To answer why they are necessary, one must understand that in order to avoid or solve conflict, something must be restricted. Something must give way. The diversity of mankind ensures that conflict is inevitable. Therefore, something will be restricted. It's just up to us to decide whether to decide what is restricted and what is not, as something will be restricted no matter what. Limits provide a, structural com a structure to the conversation that allows the participants of the conversation to not only understand their own arguments better, but to uh, understand their opponent in the conversation's argument. With this, with this standard, those who participate are able, to are able to move through the discussion more smoothly and are able to understand both their argument and others' argument. Simply, with limits present, one is able to, one is able to move through the conversation more smoothly and therefore understand it better. Now one must ask how limits can be enforced. There are two ways, by legal and social means. To enforce speech legally is to modify one's speech to abide by any legislature that exists. An example of this would be the witness oath in the court of law. One under this oath does not break it as they face retribution from the government if they do. The when one does not break this oath as they face legal retribution from the government if they do. To limit speech socially is to modify one's speech in order to associate with a certain community or to abide by the influence of a certain institution. The social limits are very widely and are very fluid and flexible as to, incor as to incorporate each of the, as to, as to um, incorporate all of the different kinds of communities and influences that different institutions have. An example of a social limit would be if, say, a certain community did not like pies for some reason. <laughs> In order to associate with such a society, with such a community, I would shun everything to do with baking with pies. I wouldn't bake pies. I wouldn't smell pies. 
because that would lead to me eating pies. I wouldn't do any, I wouldn't have anything to do with pies. Now that we know what free speech is, we must consider its value. The value of free speech is found in the diversity of opinion which it invites. Society as a whole should value free speech because it allows for the, it allows one to engage with free ideas and to grow and flourish in that. The process of shifting through ideas and consider in taking each idea and considering which one one believes is true and what is not encourages both moral and intellectual growth. Diversity in the topic of discussion exposes the participants of the discussion to new point to new perspectives and new points of view, which then encourage growth within the conversation. A person with this a person with the skills to properly utilize free speech is an asset not only to themselves but to their community because such a skill encourages them to use free speech in a way that is beneficial not only to themselves but to their whole community. The capacity to respond to contrary opinions without in it, while still honoring the person instead of just blocking out their argumentation and listening to them and honoring them instead of disrespecting them is an invaluable skill. The earlier one is able to learn and utilize this skill, the better it is for one's whole community. Therefore, for these habits to be, for these habits to be encouraged, free speech must be allowed. The limits, need, limits are needed to provide structural, a structural standard to the conversation so that the conversation is more productive than a conversation without limits imposed. A productive conversation is one in which the, is one that moves towards the entire groups a productive discussion moves towards the group's mutual understanding of the topic at hand, as well as the analysis of the questions being asked with careful consideration. With this in mind, the limits I'm proposing that allow mankind as a whole to flourish are the following. First, discussion etiquette. The purpose of etiquette is to show honor to others through our actions. We are commanded in Romans 12.10 to honor others above ourselves. In order to abide by this command in the Bible, we must apply some of the rules of etiquette to others in our lives. The first, the description of discussion etiquette varies among establishments. However, I have compiled a short list including focus and thoughtful response. The quality of focus honors others through, the quality of focus honors others through the, by respecting their opinion and actually trying to understand what they're saying instead of just brushing their opinion away as if it doesn't matter. The quality of thoughtful response is invaluable because, and shows honor to others because one is able, one is able to show honor to others through it in responding in a way that, in giving, by, by giving careful thought and consideration to another, in our reply to another person, we are showing honor to them and to the conversation. The second limit is John Stuart Mill's harm principle, which states that the only, per, the only reason that one can rightfully hold power, exercise power over another person against their will is to prevent harm to others. This limit protects those within the discussion against harm, 
which creates a more peace, which promotes the quality of peace within the discussion, which promotes a quality of peace within the discussion. This is important as one, as an environment where peace is a priority, those in the, as in such an environment where peace is a priority, one will feel safer in sharing, uh, sharing opinions that are close, that are near and dear to their hearts and which are able to, which creates a more free environment for the free flow of ideas. An important phrase to note in this limit is against their will, as it exemplifies the social contract theory. If these two limits are carried out within a discussion, both it will encourage both moral and intellectual growth. As this, as this growth continues, one is able to flourish. Exposure to new ideas, especially in discussion, leads to growth because one is able to consider new ideas and find thing, and see things from a new perspective. This leads one to process new information and interact with it. As one is processing new ideas, both moral and intellectual growth is encouraged. More intellectual growth increases as one, as one gains new information and is able to store that in their brains. Moral growth is encouraged and increases as one takes new ideas and considers them and decides whether they are true or not. As both as one grow, as one continues to grow both more and their capacity for both moral and intellectual growth, one is able to flourish. In order for students to flourish, they in the intellect, the environment that they are in must be made profitable to this objective for flour, for flourishing. In order for this to be the case, In order for this to be the case, their educational surroundings must be made beneficial to that objective. Once this is done, students have the opportun opportunity to both grow and flourish. This is important to the society as a whole because if the students of the society uh, are growing and flourishing, then that means that as they grow up and move into the world, then the society, the society as a whole will become better as it is more attuned to growth and flourishment. In conclusion, the limits of the harm principle and discussion etiquette matter because without them, free speech cannot exist in any form that is advantageous to society. A society in which these limits are enforced Greatly, flour greatly benefits because they are able to utilize free speech in a way that is beneficial because it allows the community as a whole to flourish both morally and intellectually. Citizens of a society based upon restricted speech are, not, are unable to grow and flourish because the citizens of that society are unable to challenge themselves and to grow and flourish. The government reflects the beliefs of a society, the beliefs and changes in a society. As the society grows and flourishes, so that that is reflected in the government. However, if the society is unable to grow and flourish, so will the government. In order to prevent this deterioration, free speech bounded by these few limits must be upheld in society. Thank you. One. It's time for your defense questions. Your panel is Dustin Phillips. I'm Cody Bertram, and this is Dr. Merritt, as you know. All right, first question. You talk about limits, and there's a way in which 
discussion etiquette would be managed by individuals. Um, what role does the government play in enforcing and or promoting these limits, if any? I think currently the government doesn't have much of a role, uh, much of a role in continuing and enforcing limits such as etiquette. I think that is more enforced by culture and society as a whole. Um, it is, that limit is specifically in the first category of limits that I explained in my um, speech. So I don't think the government has much of a role. No. Ron, on page three of your paper, after arguing that the founders saw freedom of speech as a natural right, you assert that freedom of expression, and I'm quoting you, freedom of expression is a right that has been allowed to the people by the government, which sounds to me more like a positive right as you've defined it. So can you clarify that apparent tension between whether uh, freedom of speech is a natural right or a positive right? A, as I remember, a natural right is something that we are, we innately have and possess as human beings. And a positive right is a right that has been given to allowed us by the government. So I would say that the limits that you talk about are, um, I would say that, could you read the quote again? I'm so sorry. Freedom of expression is a right that has been allowed to the people by the government. That sounds more like a positive right mm -hmm. to me, but you had asserted previously that it's a natural right. So there seems to be a tension in the way you're thinking about freedom of speech. Okay, yes. So what I'm trying to say is that because the government, there has been a shift in how society views the government, um, instead of when the uh, specifically the American government when it was created um, it was a very social contract theory we have we retain our, our our rights and the government only holds power over us as we see fit to give them um, but now people now society as a whole views the government as giving us all the rights that we have so I was explaining free speech in the terms of the modern view of society. And, and I was explaining free speech in the more modern view of government allowing us rights. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about your definition, if that's okay, of free speech. You define free speech as, quote, articulated communication by humans that is not inhibited by criticism or expression of disapproval. Are protests a form of free speech in your view? Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we've seen a lot of, very great increase in the amount of protesting that has happened, um, and especially an increase in the amount of news coverage and media coverage for protests, um, as I'm sure protests were happening long before this whole um, Black Lives Matter thing um, has happened, but I was just unaware of them until the point of the media, media covering them. But protests in which people are standing in the streets and you know holding signs and saying this is what i believe paying pay attention to me this is i want to show people what i believe that that is a form of free speech can i ask a follow up to that if it if a protest is interrupted by the government or um, by an opposing protesting group is that speech still free I would say that it that then there the speech of the protesting group that is being stopped or otherwise 
that is being stopped, it, their speech would then become restricted speech. Fair enough, thank you. Rowan, in your paper, you began with the, the founder's vision of free speech and the value it had for them. One of the things that strikes me is that our founders could not have possibly imagined social media, um, TV, radio, um, even music today. Um, they could not have imagined um, that. What do you see, thinking about what the founders' vision was and their purposes and their goals, what practical value does free speech have today with your generation who is surrounded by ideas on, you can't get away from them. They're everywhere. You can't turn on the radio. You can't turn on the TV, every social media. It seems like the free flow of ideas is, is more rampant today than it ever has been. And what value do you see for your generation in understanding this topic well? I think that as much as there is a, an abundance of ideas available to us today, I think it's important that we, especially as Christians, should be aware of this topic and understand free speech and how it works. Because, I mean, right now we're sitting in this auditorium and I'm sure there are not a lot of people who believe differently than everyone else here in this room. But outside of this room, we are in the minority. And so I think to promote Christianity and to um, stand firm in our beliefs, we must understand free speech and how it works. Braun, on page nine of your paper, you note that much of your argumentation depends upon society's acceptance of the idea of objective universal truth. And in some ways, that's, that's what you're valuing about free speech, is that it gives us at least the opportunity to reach for the truth, which as a Christian and as a teacher, I really value. But that assumption of objective universal truth is actually something that fewer people in our society accept. And I might even venture that the majority of our society currently rejects the idea of objective universal truth in its broadest forms. So having said that, what are the consequences of that reality that most of our society reject, rejects objective universal truth? What is the consequence of that for the actual practice of free speech in our society? Could you rephrase your question? I'm not sure if I understand. Sure. If people don't believe in objective universal truth and that we can get to that through free speech, what are the implications of that for the practice of free speech in society? I honestly don't know. Let me think. I think that although because most of our society believes, as you said, there is no objective truth, there is nothing ultimate or there's nothing that is really true and really anything that truly matters. Um, And I would say that to them, free speech, they claim that free speech is a quality that, they may claim that free speech is a quality that they're allowed by the government. Um, and they will use free speech and say that it's a right that they possess but then they don't actually use it correctly um, because they don't actually understand it. Um, and that's- It's a fair answer, thank you. Thank you. So if someone fears um, criticizing or expressing disapproval, of someone else's thoughts. Uh, this is, of course, coming back to your definition of free speech. Uh, if someone expresses these fears or, uh, you know, or, or, or is feeling a fear of criticizing or expressing disapproval during uh, communication with someone else being 
uh, in public speech or uh, written communication, social media, etc. Uh, if that person self-censors because they are afraid to criticize or to express their disapproval, is that unfree or restricted speech? How does that play into your views of free speech? I would say, yes, they are. It is restricted speech as they are self-restricting. Um, however, I would encourage them to not do so because there is a difference between disagreeing with someone's views and outright criticizing them because I think when you criticize someone it is done in such a way that is um, that is I can't think of the word but it's it's done in such a way that is meaning it's done not always meanly but it's not done with the right heart and I think that you can there's a way to go to someone and say, hey, I don't like your opinion. Like, I don't think that this is true and here's why. And I think that they should do that, um, that they should go to someone and, and make them aware of their opinion and why they disagree with that opinion. So I would encourage people who are afraid, who are self-censoring out of um, a fear of criticizing other people to not do so, but also not to criticize other people in a way that is um, not honoring them and not kind. Thank you. Rowan, part of the implications of your your thesis, and we've had this conversation, is what this looks like in the classroom, what this looks like with parents. Um, could you um, explain a little bit about the implications, this, what this would look like in a classroom, how we would teach students to do this, and what role parents would play in, in promoting and encouraging their students to understand this issue in a, in a deep way. I think that's a really good question. I really like this question. <laughs> um, I think it's very important that um, to a, a large part of teaching people how to use free speech um, correctly is to not only just is to not only tell them this is what free speech is, this is not only the definition and how it works, but also just to lead by example. I think that specifically in the classroom, the um, discussions, graded discussions, I know not everyone in here is a fan of graded discussions. I really like them, but that may just be me. Um, I think those are very helpful. I actually, when I was looking at my, when I was researching different kinds of limits, I actually used the different grading rubrics for like from different teachers at Covenant um, and kind of looked at them, looked at those to see what kind of things are being graded. So I think graded discussions are a great example of a tool that can be used in a classroom to teach free speech. I think also in the home, um, something that parents can do is to, not is to allow their children to enter into the conversation with them instead of maybe you know shoving them off in the other room and being like oh the grand oh the not the grandparents sorry the <laughs> the parents are talking um because and there there is a point where it's like okay these children are not they're they're not able to enter them into this conversation but i think that allowing your children to, and talking about different topics with your children um, is very influential in their lives, so. Rowan, in the course of answering Mr. Phillips' second question, you also managed to answer my third question, so I'm gonna defer, you lucky girl. Okay. <laughs> in your conclusion, oh, here we go, you write. Quote, without the harm principle, discussion etiquette, and thoughtful response, free speech cannot exist in any form that is advantageous to society. Pretty stiff words. What about comedy and other forms of art? 
What do you mean? I'm sorry. Meaning if a comedian, for example, I'm thinking of the harm principle. If a comedian or an artist uh, produces something that elicits a psychological response that does not feel good in someone, is that free speech? Is that detrimental to society? I think that they are using their right of free speech to say those words. I do not think that as their words created an effect that was unpleasant, I, um, I do not think that they maybe should have said that because part of, on, part of the limits that I talk about, um, a central theme to them is honoring other people and making sure that how you talk to other people and how you address them, and how you respond to them is honoring them. And so when that's not happening, I think you need to take a step back and be like, okay, I am, I am, I'm allowed to do this, but should I, should I be doing this? So. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. All right, Rowan panel's done. Here we go with the audience. Uh, to go over the ground rules, the mic is my property, it doesn't leave my hand. You get one question, no follow-up, so make it clear, make it concise. We'll start with uh, adults and teachers in the room, and then if there are, as if there's a distinction between adults and teachers, um, <laughs> and then we'll move to students if we have time. So questions from the audience. Am I gonna get lucky? <laughs> 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 oh, Tosh is just deferring to other people. Tosh hour? Okay. Mrs. Baker isn't here, so. Um, I have, my question is, you mentioned in the panel questions that culture or society would have to be who enforces these limits. So what do you think would entice a society to um, enforce the limits that you've proposed for free speech? Um, I think a society or an institution such as the church would benefit greatly um, because they would understand, hopefully, the, um, they would understand the purpose of free speech. And so that would encourage them to want to be an influence to other groups and other people. Uh, Brown, um, I think anybody who who knows me at all, I, I would hope, would would uh, say that that I'm for free speech, very very uh, important to me. But I think anybody who knows me would also say that I'm also for criticizing and often disapproving of things. So I'm trying to figure out, based on what you're saying, does that make me inconsistent or does it matter who's doing the criticizing and disapproving and does it matter how it's being done? Can you help me with my inconsistent possibilities? I think something that's kind of hard is the term criticizing often has a negative connotation. Um, and so I would say, in my interaction with you, when you do criticize, I think it's being done out of a heart for, especially towards me um, in particular. I don't know if I can talk to anyone else, yeah. but you are doing, you are criticizing me um, out of a heart that is wanting me to understand why I am wrong. And it's not, it's not, you're not trying to say, oh, I'm better than you. I'm right, you're wrong. You're trying to say, I don't think your belief, I don't think what you're saying and what you're understanding is consistent. So let me help you understand. So I think it's the intent with which you criticize and not how you criticize. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> I'm seeing from your face, it didn't, sorry. So, so Broen, this is a, a very difficult 
topic in the sense that you're combining the element of free speech with free thought. And you mentioned the cancel culture, which of course thinks into other people's heads and then shuts them down for thinking different than what other people think that they should think, right? Mm -hmm. So in, that, in light of that, I, I really have two questions, but he won't let me ask two questions. So I'll ask the more difficult. Lucky me. If the harm principle should guide the limitation on free speech and you bring in intent, which makes it even more difficult because that's free thought again, right? What about the Christian witness of biblical morality? Just speaking the truth of the Bible is offensive to many people in our culture now. So it would be canceled because it's not nice, even though it's truth. So how do you reconcile that? I reconcile that by saying that those who cancel obviously do not understand free speech and how it works <laughs> because they are inconsistent in how they apply free speech. People who cancel, they say, they say, I'm allowed to say whatever I want because I have free speech. However, you who do not, you do not get to have the right of free speech because it offends me. And so it's just very inconsistent. And I think that to, to um, for those two to be reconciled, then it, it, it's to hold, you would be holding, them to a standard that they can't be held accountable to, so. All right, I have time for one more brief question. I've got a senior hand up. Okay. Hi, Rowan. Um, you talked about how like graded discussions are helpful for students building a desire for free speech, but are there any elements of education that in your experience you would criticize as suppressing students' desire for free speech? I think practically just a class that is based on lectures does that because it does not really, aside from any questions that the student may ask the teacher, it doesn't have any quality of discussion added to the class. So I would say that that type, that specific instance in education would not encourage free speech as the students are not encouraged to talk. Um, but other than that, that's the only one I can think of. Rowan, you're done.